live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE, covering the AWS Accenture Executive Summit. Brought to you by Accenture. Welcome back everyone to theCUBE's live coverage of the AWS Executive Summit here at the Venetian in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm your host, Rebecca Knight. We have two guests for this segment. We have Adam Burden, Chief Software Engineer at Accenture, and Chris Scott, uh, AWS North America Lead. Thank you both so much for coming back on theCUBE, for returning. Sure, thanks for having awesome. us. Thanks. So we're talking today about future systems. So in the past, Accenture, when, it, when Accenture has talked about this, it's talked about the future of applications, future applications. Now it's future systems. What are we talking about, first of all, sure. and, and, and why the switch? Uh, look, it's, a, it's, it's actually a key question uh, for us, and I, I think that um, we aspire to be to our clients, thought leaders, about where we believe that the technology landscape of tomorrow is heading. Um, to help give them guidance about the path that they should chart their own systems on today. And we wrote uh, a, a, a kind of a seminal paper several years ago called The Future of Applications. Uh, and it laid out different strategies that uh, our clients, we recommended to our clients that they follow in order to build the technology systems of tomorrow. And in, and we, in it we had three characteristics, liquid, intelligent, and connected. Uh, and uh, the outcome from that was great. It, it was an inspiration for many of them to build their future technology landscape. Um, and that language of liquid, intelligent, connected um, from a, a white paper that was written five years ago has really entered the lexicon of many of our clients and in industry. Now, however, they've seen this success, but they want to be able to do that truly at scale. They want to be able to take advantage of of uh, applications and the way that they're built uh, and designed for tomorrow, but do that at an enterprise-wide scale. And we felt like it was a time for us to go back and reflect upon what we had wrote about as the future of applications and said, let's, let's think about how systems, you know, three years on, four years on, are going to be built for tomorrow. And that's exactly what we did in future systems. So future systems, you can look at it as a compass um, for how they'll continue to chart their path to be able to scale the new uh, and close something that we call the innovation achievement gap. Uh, and uh, this innovation achievement gap is really kind of the diagnosis that we put on there of where they've seen success in pockets of innovation across their enterprise, but they want to be able to have that occurring across all of their businesses simultaneously. Uh, and we believe that you know, following some of the prescriptive advice that we provide in future systems, uh, that clients, our clients would be able to do exactly that. So I want to dig into that research a little bit, and you, you said liquid, intelligent, connected, those really became part of the vernacular. Yeah. This year it's three new. Three, three new, new ones. ones, that's right. Boundaryless, <laughs> adaptable, and radically human. These are the exactly. characteristics that you say are the secret sauce uh, for a successful system. That's right. So let, let's get into these a little bit. Let's start with boundaryless. Sure. Boundaryless is great to talk here about reInvent because it, it really is all about cloud and how you use cloud. But before I get ahead of myself, you really define what boundaryless is. It naturally it's about breaking down barriers between systems, between businesses, and between humans and machines. And su su successful companies that do this can really quickly respond to the market because their systems are very agile and can react. There are two really important elements to boundaryless. First is cloud. Being able to leverage cloud, not just as a data center, but it's an innovation platform to be able to do more. Leveraging the great services from AWS, like Lambda and API Gateway, and across the entire stack of AWS services, and leveraging automation, and really getting beyond infrastructure to treating it infrastructure as code with an environment is an important component of that. The second is decoupling. It's decoupling applications and data. For years, we designed systems, and the data that's part of that system would remain within that system but you didn't get the value out of it by linking that across various parts of the organization. So it's important to decouple that data and application and give that access to other parts of the organization. The other important part is decoupling applications from legacy infrastructure. I talked a little about infrastructure as code. That's an important component of it. And lastly, it's decoupling integrated systems into loosely coupled applications and systems. And that's important because you develop components that you can share across the organization. You do it really well for one system. You want to share that component across other systems systems in the organization. So Adam and I were talking a little bit about boundaryless and different 
examples that we've seen in working with our clients. Adam had a really good one that he was yeah, talking about so before. Th this, I think this characteristic kind of sets the foundation for how future systems are, are going to be constructed. And you know, when you think about um, the restrictions that you perhaps even falsely place on, on uh, applications today um, by you know, sort of limiting how much they can actually expand or grow or scale over time, uh, you're limiting the potential growth of your business. And that's why we think it's so important that as you're designing and building systems of tomorrow, and we're working with a client right now who is uh, rethinking their loyalty uh, program. It's uh, Cathay Pacific, a big uh, airline. We're going to be speaking with and them later on yeah, the Yeah, and, and it's, a, it's, a, it's a remarkable story, and you're going to get a lot of details of this later. Um, but what I really love about this is they've embraced this concept of, of boundaryless by introducing blockchain technologies and cloud into how their loyalty points program is going to work in the future. So whether they have mm -hmm. you know, 10 partners, 1,000 partners, or 10,000 partners in there, the, the way that they've constructed their system is it is going to elastically scale to be able to support all that, and it's going to make it faster and uh, a better with higher quality than ever before for them to onboard new partners and even more importantly, serve uh, their mile point program customers better. Mm -hmm. So great example of boundaryless and how the systems of tomorrow are going to be and built. And particularly because you said that that was a big challenge that it, it's not only not communicating with your partners but it's also not communicating within the business, yeah. the different units <laughs> not talking to each exactly. other. Exactly. So let's move on to adaptable. And adapt, you think every system's got to be adaptable, <laughs> duh, but what, what do we mean? Let's, let's break it down. It's actually, you know, th this is uh, an, uh, a really interesting uh, challenge for us and you're starting to see the early stages now of, of systems and technologies that can embrace these characteristics. Basically what we mean by adaptable is that these are systems that autonomously change. Um, they anticipate, uh, for example, new loads um, or performance expectations, or they, they anticipate certain changes in user patterns or behavior and actually reorganize themselves without you telling them to do it. So they're taking advantage of trusted data and artificial intelligence and, and other elements so that they can perform better and that you can focus more attention on the business value that's delivered on top of them. Um, a, a great ex a, a analogy that I've used for this is imagine you've got kind of two gears that are turning towards each other, right? And one gear has like a really big tooth on it and you can kind of see it coming and it's going to wreck the other gear when it gets there. Well, imagine that gear sort of sees that coming and adapts and says, okay, I can make this you know, area wider and that tooth will fit right in there. That's what adaptable is all, is all about, is it's looking at what's happening around it and it's adjusting itself so it can perform better in the enterprise instead of falling over. And that makes your systems more reliable, it makes your customer experiences better, and allows you to have systems that will allow, make you one of these high performers of tomorrow. Ad ad anticipating and adapting. Anticipating yeah. and adapting, exactly right. Finally, the, the final characteristic, radically human. I yeah. love this. <laughs> um, <laughs> Define what it is, and then I want to talk about the, the kinds of companies that you've seen mm -hmm. do, this, do this best. Yeah, radically human, I, I love the term too. I, th I think it's great. It's really about creating systems that are simple, they're elegant, but they're also immersive to our customers. Natural language processing, computer vision, machine learning are all important components. And it, it's really about how these systems listen, they see, they can adapt, they understand what's going on, just like people do. And it's interesting that, that technology has become so invasive in our lives, but it's also become invisible. And it's woven to the fabric of what we do with digital assistants and all the things that are out there today. It's such an important part of what we do. Uh, so it's important to create systems that are aligned to the users. And this has created an interesting inversion. Uh, you know, we would design systems in the past that would, that would gather requirements and then eventually when the system went live, you'd have to train all of the users how to use that system and you would have to adapt the user to the system. Now what we're talking about is developing systems that can adapt to the adaptable point that Adam mentioned, but really change to work better for the users. We were talking a little bit before as well about Amazon Connect and a great example of this is leveraging Connect and omni-channel capabilities to allow customers to interact with customer service and businesses the way they want to interact, whether that's via phone or through online or text message. Find the right medium to get them the right answers as fast as possible. You know, a great example of this is a client that we're working with, Mutual of Omaha, who's going to be here on theCUBE and we've done a breakout session with them. They've been through this whole journey and they've really gotten much better customer engagement through this. So it's not necessarily 
feeling that your technology is mimicking a human. It's really just the technology is what you, the human, want it to be mm -hmm. in, in whatever format. I mean, is that right? That's a really interesting way of putting it. Yeah. It's about so many times, and there's examples all around us mm -hmm. of where you know, people have kind of adapted to technology rather than us mm -hmm. adapting to, uh, or rather than the technology adapting to us. I mean, even, even the keyboard I have right here, right, the keyboard. This keyboard in the layout was invented in 1870, okay? <laughs> and it was invented in a way to actually slow down typists so that the arms wouldn't get stuck, to, mm -hmm. stuck on it. I mean, why are we still suffering with a keyboard that limits how fast we can yeah. type this many years later? And that's the point we're trying to make with Radically Human is that we should be thinking about how technology is designed around people uh, rather than the other way around. So that's a real cultural shift that has to take mm -hmm. place within companies. So how, how, what are some of the best practices that, that sort of how companies can become more radically human and their, and their systems become more radically human? Well, I, have, I mean, look, uh, there's, there's human-centered design uh, is, is a really important aspect of it, and there's some, a lot of great emerging thought um, in that space. We think that design thinking contributes a lot to Absolutely. kind of really thinking from the very beginning about how, how, do we, uh, how do we build applications or technology systems in the future that are going to work with people. So it's human plus machine, not human versus machine. Mm -hmm. uh, and we think the outcomes that you get from embracing some of those approaches allow you to, to build solutions and design them that are much more radically human uh, in the future. And this is really important. You're going to be more productive, more effective, your workforce is going to be happier, your customers are going to be happier, and they're going to be more engaged. And there's a paradox here too, is that the more we do this, actually the less you'll see of the technology. Uh, and it, because it'll become mm -hmm. embedded in the things around us. Yeah. So maybe, I've actually, I've, I've written some things in the past that says AI is the new UI and, mm -hmm. and the end of screens, right? So maybe, it doesn't really mean the end of screens, but we're going to see a lot less screens because it's easier for people to hear information uh, mm -hmm. sometimes than it is to actually see it. Right, mm -hmm. I, this is really fascinating stuff. <laughs> Thank you both so much for coming back on theCUBE for these, this great conversation. Thanks, we're Rebecca. happy to. Thank you, Rebecca. Adam and Chris, thank you. Thank you. I'm Rebecca Knight. We will have more of theCUBE's live coverage of the AWS Executive Summit coming up in just a little bit.